Nash. Um, rules for Q&A, no long expositions, um, don't say any like a long-winded question sort of thing. Um, and just ask a question at the end of what you're saying. You can line up behind Tristan. I also think I have as a rule of thumb, it's just to make this more fun. It would be nice to start with the questions that are hostile. So, let me suggest that if you have a hostile question, you can kind of mosey your way to the front. Hello, sir. My name is Jason Spires. I'm a current Sanford student, and I'm getting ready to start up the Libertarian chapter here on campus. Uh, if anybody wants to join, please join me. Um, my question comes that I've seen that this is supposed to be moral defense to build the wall. And we can argue whether we need to secure our borders to stop immigrants from coming in. But is the question really about using eminent domain to take people's private property to build a wall, or is it about finding a way to sustain our border? to stop people from being able to scale. Like you said, Stanford has found a way to prevent intruders without a physical wall. Shouldn't the U.S. aspire to do just as good as Stanford is? I take your question to be asking not a question about whether we need a wall, but what kind of a wall. And I'm using the term wall here metaphorically. Uh, you seem to agree. This reminds me a little bit about a frost foam mending wall. Because in Mending Wall, you've got a neighbor who's railing against his neighbor for building a wall, right? But while he's railing on the neighbor for building a wall, he never claims the right to go into his neighbor's property. He never claims the right to take his neighbor's stuff. He accepts the need for a wall. He just doesn't like the wall. He thinks it can be done a different way. And I agree with you. Let me suggest this way. If you have a better suggestion, for how to actually enforce security on the southern border. Let's just say through a combination of various techniques. You should propose it. I think, see, the problem is these topics are never debated. They're never debated. Right now, the debate is frozen between the wall or, in effect, porous borders. It's a very bad debate. We should actually be debating what is the best way to enforce security on the southern border. And I'm not dogmatic about that. I have, I'm open to all kinds of ideas. I think Trump's point in, in emphasizing the wall is simply this, that for now 30 years, there are these bogus debates about fixing immigration and things like, what do we, we do with all the illegals who in America and so on? None of those problems can be seriously considered until a country has a real border. Now, again, you seem to agree, there should be a border, there's just a better way to do it. To take citizens' private property. Ever? And, and your analogy, and I'm not being I do. rude, I, I admire what you're doing, but your analogy is flawed because the neighbor building the wall, in order for your analogy to work, the neighbor would have to step over my property line, take my property, and try to build that wall on my property. And that's what unit domain does, it takes private citizens' property. Now, we can argue over how secure a border needs to be and how to go about it. But when you begin the argument with we need to forcefully take somebody's stuff, that is not a good foundation to start with. Let me ask you this. In the settling of America, do you think that eminent domain should have been prohibited? Do I think prohibited? Yeah, you're building a railroad that's running, let's just say, from New York to California, and there's a group of people in the way who have homes and they don't want to sell, and they don't want to sell at any price. What do you think should happen? I believe all alternatives should be considered, and if it's ruled that there's no other way to do it but that, and it's in a national security, then I'd say yes. But the problem is the argument is became more about, I want a wall to feel good about seeing a wall, rather than I want to make sure it's my border us. is secure. I'm in the second camp. Okay, let's keep going. say something about uh, Professor Jeffrey Hart of Dartmouth who just died and I believe was a mentor of yours and I think people here particularly students would be interested in your experience. So 
The question is about um, a um, dear and influential professor of mine, Jeff Hart, who was a deputy of Bill Buckley's at National Review. Um, he was a very interesting character because actually in his later years, he became a leftist. Uh, he became a Democrat, he became a champion of Obama, and yet he has a whole generation of Dartmouth students who are conservative, spread out in all kinds of industries that he shaped and influenced. And so it's actually been for us very sort of bittersweet to watch, you may say, the evolution of Jeffrey Hart. In his later years, I would have these knockdown debate track arguments with him about Obama. He would say things like, Dinesh, you have to admit, Bush was a complete idiot, um, and Obama is a genuine constitutional scholar. <laughs> and I said, Jeff, Obama was a smart guy, don't get me wrong, but has never published a scholarly article on the Constitution or any other subject in any scholarly journal in his life. And he'd be like, what about the book Reading Obama by this guy Kloppenberg? I'm like, go read that book. This is an example of fake history. So this Kloppenberg is a Harvard historian. Kloppenberg will quote Obama saying things like, I'm a pragmatist. And then from that phrase, Kloppenberg goes, pragmatism. C.S. Pierce, William James, the early 20th century pragmatist, just debating the nature of truth. Here's Obama saying the truth itself is up for grabs. Obama saying none of the above. He's probably never heard of C.S. Pierce. He's probably barely heard of William James. You take, this is like the movie with Chancellor Gardner. You take pedestrian statements, infuse meaning into them, and declare the guy to be the smartest guy since Oliver Wendell Holmes. I mean, this to me is intellectual sleight of hand. It's embarrassing. Now, Hart was well into his 80s when we had these debates. Uh, when, I, when, I was a, when I was 17 years old, I thought of conservatives as really boring people who had toothbrush mustaches and walked around with umbrellas. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be that. And then when I met Jeffrey Hart, this was a guy who had played in the US Open. This was a guy who was colorful, outrageous, comical. He's one of the few people who could make you laugh out loud and was genuinely interested in ideas. Uh, he showed me a whole world of books and ideas I'd never heard of. I was a kid off the boat, you might say, from India. And, uh, and I thought to myself, here's a whole world of knowledge, and here's a whole set of answers, and I didn't even know there were questions. So it was very important to my intellectual development to be exposed to that. And, um, and I came to understand, people said, well, Dinesh, when did you convert? When did you become a conservative? And it occurred to me, I never did. It was more like I immersed myself in conservative ideas, and I recognized that I'd always been a conservative. It was more a form of awakening than it was a conversion from one thing to another. And I think this is, by the way, true of most Asian Americans. We are conservative in our bones, and conservatism is a reflection of the things we already know and the way we already live. It merely articulates those ideas. You made the argument that Democrats are the party of racism and slavery, and I will concede that it's true that Democrats in the 1880s were Democrats that perpetuated slavery. But I need to ask, how do you just how do you think through that lens when you look at the Southern strategy and you look at the fact that it was a Democratic president? who put the Civil Rights Act into law. And afterwards, it was Republicans who perpetuated this other strategy to try to make African Americans not vote. The question is about uh, the fact that, yes, the Democrats may be the party of slavery and racism. I think you then said something that was unfair, which is that I'll grant you in the 1880s, let's remember that the Ku Klux Klan was revived in the early 20th century, the lynchings and hangings that we identify with the Klan all occurred, a lot of them occurred in the, 19, in the teens and 20s, um, and the opposition to the civil rights was in the 60s. Now, with the solitary exception of, yes, Lyndon Johnson pushed the Civil Rights Act. True. And this is a longer story which I won't be able to do justice to here, but why did he do it? Why did he do it? My argument is the following. After World War II, the horrific evidence of the concentration camps and the racism of Hitler began to have a powerful effect worldwide. It drove anti-colonialism in the third world, 
but it also drove a diminution of racism in the American South. Racism was dropping rapidly in the American South after 1945. Now, you have to realize this was a huge problem for the Democratic Party because after the Civil War, the glue holding the Democratic Party together in the South was, in fact, white supremacy. And so for Lyndon Johnson, it's like, now what? We're actually losing our base. The key to Nixon's Southern strategy was to appeal to the non-racist whites in the urban South. Read about it. Because the Southern strategy that you're describing is a myth. The actual Southern strategy was really simple. Many people in the South are moving away from, the South is changing from an agricultural society to an industrial society. Many Northerners are moving South to places like Tampa and Atlanta and Raleigh-Durham and Houston. And Nixon's strategy was, I'm not campaigning in the rural South. That's racist country, I'm gonna leave that to the Democrats. I'm gonna campaign in the urban South and win the Northern, the displaced Northerners and the non-racist Southerners. That was Nixon's Southern strategy and the proof? Just go look at what Nixon actually won. He won the urban South, he lost the Deep South. In 1968, the Deep South went for George Wallace, not Richard Nixon. And so, what we're dealing with here is an argument about history but an argument that's very important because of the claim of the party switch, which I deny. It's not even nine. Um, so I just, uh, this is kind of a question more like clarification um, about something that you said. Um, I'm interested in hearing you expand on uh, this following statement. Um, to paraphrase, you highlighted the fact that you are a man of Indian descent and your wife is a woman of Mexican and Venezuelan descent implying it's impossible, or at least highly unlikely, that uh, you are or could be racist. Um, I'm concerned you use your Indian heritage as a diversity card to shield yourself from Jeez. criticism about racially or ethnically problematic enemy, comments and or stances that you've made or taken in the past. Um, is this not opposite but parallel to the stereotype that all people who are white are racist? Um, a claim I don't agree with, um, and one that I'll concede some of the leftists you disagree with do employ for their purposes. Um, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on that, hear you expand on that. I think, um, I have never, I'm familiar with the view, but I don't share it, that people of color intrinsically cannot be racist. This is actually a doctrine of the left. And I don't agree with it because I think that Racism is a doctrine of racial superiority, inferiority, of racial denigration. So obviously, in principle, it's possible for anyone to be a racist. Now, that being said, we always have to balance what someone says with a contextual use of what they said and with a fair attribution of the label. Because I think you would agree that if you go around calling people racist, just because they say things you don't agree with, or they, say they, they, they have a disputed interpretation of something that, um, let's just take a topic, let's just take, for example, slavery or a topic like that. Open debate is not racist. Open debate is very healthy in an academic community. Racial denigration is racist. So I ask you in fairness, I've been up here now speaking uh, if you believe the posters and the dissenters and the comments and the Stanford paper and so on, I, you might have expected me to stand up and give you 45 minutes of racial invective. So a very good way to test these things is to ask you, have you heard me say anything tonight that you would consider racist? And if not, why would you even raise that term in my connection? Um, so, I will concede to you, um, I do not hear anything explicitly racist, and I, I do have to say I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, however, just looking at some of the tweets and some of the publications tweets. and comments you have made in the past, um, and I, I can't recall specifically um, some right now, and I realize that, I realize that looks shady, and I apologize. <laughs> um, if I had photographic memory, I would pull those up, but I don't. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that I've seen some tweets and some publications and comments you've made that some could argue are racially charged, uh, which is why I brought this question up. But no, I, I will concede that you did this tonight. Let me, let me address that for a minute, because this is a case where I think it is good to go to the heart of the matter. Um, 
the example that is most frequently used in this context um, on social media occurred uh, about a year ago um, when I released the movie Death of a Nation. Now, if you've seen this movie, the thrust of this movie, somewhat along the lines of my talk, is that the racism and the fascism, which I dramatized luridly in the movie, are actually the work of the left and in America of the Democratic Party. So, in the heat of promoting this movie, I was flying around the That's country, good. and someone on the left decided to set a trap for me. And so what they did was they tweeted my movie trailer, great movie, watch this movie, hashtag bring back slavery. Mm. Right? Now, I looked at the person's account, it's a fake account. I wasn't accidentally retweeting a white supremacist, nothing like that. This was someone on the left who tried to trap me by putting the hashtag knowing that in the craziness of movie promotion, doing 30 or 40 retweets a day, trying to promote my movie, I would retweet the trailer without seeing the hashtag. And that's what happened. I retweeted the trailer. Seconds later, it was pointed out to me, I deleted it. But the people who planted it were there to capture the image and then send it out everywhere. It resulted in me losing speaking engagements and so on. So let me ask you this. What's really insidious here? That I unwittingly and foolishly, but nevertheless, inadvertently, I mean, I've written 17 books. I couldn't be a scholar at the Hoover Institution if I really believed bring back slavery. No sane person in public life would do that. So, so to, to set me up and then use this to try to destroy my career by pretending people who knew better, that they were trying to attribute to me something I never believed I would never do. So which is more dangerous, me accidentally doing the retweet, or the evil people who were trying to destroy my career by smearing me with opinions that I don't hold? In all honesty, I'd ask you to think about that. And I also say to all of you, I really appreciate the, I expected this to be a stormier event, <laughs> just given the, the way it was set up, but you've listened very attentively. The questions have actually been excellent. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I'm going to get out there and see what's going on. Okay. Sounds like something crazy is happening outside. I don't even know what's going on. I mean, I know what they And there's the show.